On today's video, we're gonna take a look into the coolest Van Halen riff that nobody ever talks about. Kid, it's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. I think it says a lot that I have been listening to Van Halen for about 38 years now, and I'm still discovering new things hidden inside those classic tracks. Just the other day, I was listening to Mean Street, one of the most ferocious guitar performances of all time, and I happened to notice the riff that was going on behind the guitar solo. I think, like most of us, I've always been so enchanted by what Eddie was playing on the lead that I never took the time to listen to what was going on in the rhythm track, but this riff that's behind the solo is one of the six thickest riffs in the Van Halen catalog, and I don't think I've ever heard anybody mention it. So in today's video, we're gonna take a deep dive into what makes this riff tick and what makes it so freaking cool. As always, this video is brought to you guys by everybody who supports my channel over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benelderguitars. Sign up today, even for just a buck a month, you're gonna get access to all kinds of goodies, like bonus lessons, backing tracks, vlogs, and so much more. This week, everybody who supports the channel, even for just a buck a month, is gonna get tabs to go along with this lesson. That way you can follow along and play it like Eddie did. Patreon.com slash benelderguitars. Thanks. Gear-wise for today's video, I'm playing this lovely EVH standard series that I just got from the fine folks over at Sweetwater. I got this guitar a couple weeks ago. I've already played like two entire shows on it and I am seriously impressed with what they're doing with this line. Really well built guitars, super fun to play. I'm playing this through the actually the EVH phaser that MXR makes which is really awesome for the intro part right there of the bridge and I'm playing that into the EVH EL34 100 watt head. Just all kinds of EVH gear going on in here. And just because I know somebody in the comments is gonna ask, here are my settings for the amp. I'm using the blue channel today. And I'm playing that amp through the Sir RLIR box to record directly to my interface. Now tuning wise, I've got this tuned down a half step right here. But in accordance with the sacred laws of EVH, I also have the B string tuned slightly flat. So it's a little bit below B flat. I'll show you here on the tuner what that looks like right there. You can also see all my dog hair all over my pedal board. Very nice. Okay, first things first, let's talk about that phaser riff that comes in before the solo section. Pretty simple sounding riff, but I've never heard anybody make it sound exactly like Eddie, myself included. So it's important to remember that this is just a guideline of how we played this part. There's always some randomness, some variance in the way that Eddie played his riffs, and you guys know as well as I do that he played them live completely differently than he did on the record. Uh, watching through a bunch of live videos here on YouTube, I've seen him play it up in some higher positions with some slides and stuff like that. Um, I think the video that I found that had the best view of what his hands are actually doing is this one right here. So I kind of catered my hand positions and stuff around what I'm seeing in this video of him playing it a couple years ago. There's some really bad tabs for this song floating around out there, so don't worry about those. Watch what he's doing in that video and you'll see our hand positions today are pretty dang similar. Now in this riff, he's using that phaser on there. I'm gonna leave that off just so you can hear the notes a little bit better. And remember to play this again with some variance. Don't feel super stuck on everything I'm playing note by note because that's not what Eddie did either. That's kind of the basic figure of what we're doing right here. Uh, you'll notice that it sounds kind of out of tune on the record. Again, that's because that B string is kind of flat, so a lot of these intervals don't really ring out exactly true, but Eddie's so badass that it doesn't even matter. So you'll notice that this starts off here with this kind of sliding power chord on the top two strings, kind of like a G to an A power chord. And it sounds like a lot of the times, he finishes that off here with this F sharp note, like that. 
couple of just muted swishes through the strings like that. You'll notice I'm playing this with my first finger kind of behind the power chord. I'm not using my first finger to play the power chord like that. That just makes it a little bit easier to do all the muting to me. Now the next figure is gonna be sliding in here to your A, or sorry, E and A notes, then down to this little D dyad of D and F sharp. Two more muted strokes after that. And then this lick. A little pull off thing in A minor pentatonic. Now with that first power chord slide, sometimes he hits that F sharp note, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes it's just like that right there. Sometimes it even sounds like it's just just the high E note on there. Don't try to be super exact with it. It'll sound more like Eddie in the long run. Okay, so after that, you're gonna have two open A chugs to start the riff off. You're gonna play the sliding power chord thing again. Two more muted strokes. And then the little finisher there is this. Little dyads here on the G and B strings. Again, there's our F sharp and B note. We're just gonna slide that up a half step. Two D strings this time, then do that again. And that's the basis of that riff. So you got your power chord, your optional F sharp. Again, it's kind of approximate, but that is pretty much what's going on, and it looks like the right positions and stuff. Now let's talk about that super badass riff that goes behind the guitar solo. How I've listened to the song so many times and never noticed that riff until just recently is beyond me. I have no idea. It almost sounds like Eddie Van Halen channeling ZZ Top or something, but the beat and syncopation of this is so weird and it has to do with the group effort of what everybody's playing. We'll talk about that in a second here too. But it's pretty basic stuff. Starting off with your little pull off here from C to A. Couple of upstrokes. These have to be upstrokes to sound right on that A power chord. Then, so we got some chug days here. C. And then he kind of slides from C to D with a little bit of a pinch harmonic. Like that right there. Again, kind of Billy Gibbons style. And then after that, you're going to play. It's almost the same riff, but ending with a G instead. Like that. So again, we got our pull off, two swipes, and then the lick. Again, a little bit of a pinch harmonic on that low G note there, too. And that's on repeat there for a while. Now you'll notice that the very first time through, and the very first time through only, we did the three upward swipes, right? All the other ones after that are just two swipes. That has to do with how this riff is syncopated, which is what makes it so freaking cool. And then the last time through the riff, we have this little lick to kind of wrap up the solo section. Now that lick is starting off on A, then we're gonna walk up chromatically from F sharp. So F sharp, G, G sharp, okay? One, two, and then this last time we're gonna play this. It's like a little abbreviated version of it. A, G, G sharp, okay? And then you're gonna play the D and G strings here in front number five, little C dyad, okay? You can finger that a bunch of different ways, I guess. I think that's the most comfy one, personally, going from one, two, three, four, and then this time I go four, one, two, three, for that last kind of shortened lick right there. Pretty cool stuff. So the entire section is gonna sound like this. So sick. 
And again, there's a lot of little variations in there. Sometimes it's an open E, sometimes it's a G, to, or sorry, A to G. Little variances in there, uh, but just play it good and loose and use that as kind of a format. And you'll have an idea of how that riff works the way that it does. But it's not just Eddie's legendary rhythm skills that make this section so sick. It's what Alex and Michael are doing as well. This section is really syncopated. And I think between the three of them, there's really no subdivision that's untouched at some point right here. I want to show you guys a little bit how the drums, guitars, and bass are all working together here to create such a massive groove. Now, I've kind of recreated the track here in Logic. Uh, I programmed the drums in Superior Drummer 3. I recorded the bass myself based on the isolated rhythm tracks that you can find here on YouTube. If you just type in Mean Street, bass and drums only, you'll find what I'm talking about. It has the guitar filtered out so you can really hear what Alex and Michael are doing. So I recreated it and it's it's not perfect. I'm not going to claim that it is, but I got the kick and snare patterns just right and everything that the bass is doing. Um, Alex on that ride cymbal is playing some really random stuff. So I just kind of played random crap, you know, when I was programming it. So my ride work here is not really exactly right, but what makes it sound so cool is the kick and snare pattern. Check this out right here. It's really sick, right? So here's the thing about this. Whenever it starts, it has a completely different groove than where it ends up. And to show you that, I'm just going to isolate just what the kick and snare are doing for you guys so you can hear it better. So you guys might remember whenever I was talking about the guitar part, how the first version of the riff has the three swipes, then the rest of it is all more syncopated and just has the two swipes that are like later in the beat, right? Well, Alex kind of had to coordinate that with this drum part too. And again, I don't think I got this exactly right or anything, but what you'll notice is the first time through the riff, his kick and snare pattern to me, I just call it the immigrant song pattern. Do, 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 da, da. It's a really familiar pattern that a lot of drummers have used in history. Do, 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 da, da, with the kick and snare like that. After that, though, that's the groove. And it just does that straight through. He's doing all this random crap on the ride, but the kick and snare pattern here has this like. Uh, dotted eighth kind of thing going on that is really funky and mesmerizing. Listen to it again. You're gonna hear immigrant song and then the entire rest of the way through. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Snare is always on beats two, four. But that kick is just kind of dancing around it in a really cool sounding way. Now on top of that really syncopated drum groove, we have that riff again, right? And the cool thing that's happening with this riff is the way that it gets deeper into the groove after that very first repetition. Now the first repetition starts on beat number one. One, two, three, four, one. But all the other iterations after that actually start, or at least it feels like it starts, on the upbeat of one. One, two, three, four, one. It gives it this really screwy, like confusing feel, right? Because it's coming in on the end of one. This is kind of interesting because so many times in rock guitar stuff, we do what we call a pushed down beat which is where a riff starts on the upbeat of four. Um, Dave Grohl is like the king of this. Let me just detune this thing real quick, because I know you know this rhythm right here. Like the Everlong chorus, right? One, two, three, and four, and two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one. Here those riffs are all kind of coming in on the up, of four, it kind of gives you that pushed feel. By the way, how awesome is that D tuna, right? Works great. Anyway, with this riff, it's the total opposite of that. Rather than doing the rock and roll guitar thing and pushing beat number one, it's actually doing a more funky bluesy thing and hanging on to that little D note uh, shake that we do past beat number one and inserting us back into the riff late on the up of one. And it's all because of how that riff ends up hanging on that last note over the measure line. So when he restarts on that up of beat number one, he's got half a beat's time less than he had. So that's why the riff kind of gets shortened and compressed after that. Really, 
Really cool effect, man. And again, I, I don't really see a lot of riffs starting on the up of one. That's such a weird thing to do, but it makes the groove so freaking cool. Now, in contrast to what Alex and Eddie are doing here, where they're super syncopated and everything, the cool thing that Michael is doing here on the bass is just plowing straight through it. He's not playing the groove like Eddie. He's playing more like a straight 16th note kind of feel. Uh, just plowing straight through the groove and everything and making the entire thing drive really hard. Let's do that bass part on its own. Cool lick right there, right? Really cool. So again, Michael is playing a super simple thing, just keeping it really straight like that, right? And then you'll notice, in order to stay hanging with the groove, he does hang on to those C and G notes past the measure line. Like that right there. And even that lick that he plays, it kind of terminates with this note going over the measure line again. So that way when he returns to the A note, we're back on that upbeat of four again. And then I notice he goes up an octave. Oh no, sorry. He does the same shortened version of the chromatic lick there at the end to wrap that part up. Again, it's just really cool to see how you have the drums and guitars being all over the beat, the bass playing straight on through to keep the groove going and keep the drive going, you know? But then also acknowledging those late hits that I was talking about. Really cool stuff. People give Michael Anthony a lot of shit about his bass playing, and I think that is such a major league disrespect. Michael played the right stuff for every section, guys. Like, with Eddie doing stuff as ferocious and fiery as he was on guitar, I would not want to hear some bass virtuoso keeping up with him note for note. I think that would be super lame, personally. It would take the focus off of the amazing stuff that Eddie was doing, and it would kill the groove, you know? Michael played simple stuff because that's exactly what needed to be there. Not to mention, Honestly, he's probably the best singer the band has ever had. So I think the stuff that Michael chose to play, although it is technically simple, was exactly what these parts needed. Let me know if you agree in the comments section. So there you go, guys. A look into one of the most underrated Van Halen riffs of all time. But there's so many more to choose from. So let me know in the comments section where your favorite underrated Van Halen riff is. I'm also going to put up there that some of my favorites are the riffs in like Me Wise Magic and Can't Get This Stuff No More. I think those are super awesome, underappreciated tunes. If you like this video and want to get more out of it, be sure to sign up to that Patreon page today over at patreon.com slash Guitars. Grab the tabs, check out the bonus videos, and enjoy a community community of awesome people just like yourself. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, uh, liking it, subscribing to the channel, all that jazz. Be sure to ring the bell down there for notifications every time I upload a new slice of fried gold. And again, subscribe guys. Checked my YouTube analytics the other day and something like 50 or 60 percent of my views come from people that aren't subscribed to my channel. So do me a favor, just click that button down there and subscribe today. Thanks. Well guys, it's been fun as always, but I think it's time for me to go, well, I'll probably just play some more guitar, honestly. As for you guys, I recommend getting away from the computer, grabbing your instrument, and getting to work. Let's click it. More picking.